gentleman here. Question for the cast, especially the chaps. I think, um, what would your ten-year-old selves have thought of you now playing out a western on this scale? And did those perhaps, uh, childhood games perhaps give you your taste for acting that you've subsequently followed on to? I think Harry, so. do you want to answer that? Yeah, I think I think there is something um, about playing a cowboy that <clears throat> was probably inspirational. It's I didn't want to stop doing that, and that would have been what you were playing around in your garden with your friends. And uh, so to find myself 20 years on, trying with an adult brain to learn how to twirl a gun for a sort of completely professional reason, it was strange but good. <laughs> <laughs> Felt good. I always wanted to be a cowboy, by the way, so... Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I did my best in this one. She kind of is. Yeah, I am a cowboy. <laughs> I still haven't, uh, I don't think I've developed a taste for acting yet. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever will, to be honest, but, uh, you know, I've had worse jobs. Um, <laughs> a lot worse. Um, I, I mean, if there's any, there, is, there may be something in the fact that, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, I'd been told growing up that we had um, some, some degree of, of Native American blood in us, you know, that, that I always found that a point of pride. So when it came to cowboys and Indians and stuff, I most certainly uh, did not want to be John Wayne, you know. I wanted to be, uh, yeah, I wanted to be uh, one of the Indians. I think I'm, I think I'm with uh, JD on this one. Uh, when I grew up, I did, a, I did a program called Indian Guides. And it's kind of like Boy Scouts, except it's the Native American aspect and you learn, you know, like indigenous, Native American skills that you know they would have needed to survive. Uh, so I had a really, really cool pair of moccasins that I thought when I put them on it gave me superpowers. <laughs> and I could walk around completely silently, and uh, I loved it. So I was always, I was always the Indian and Cowboys and Indians. He gave me the magic moccasins. <laughs> <laughs> now and again, I just trot around in them. <laughs> They'll sneak up on you. It's terrifying. They make me faster. <laughs> um, should we move on to the gentleman with the check yeah. shirt? Hi, another question. Of, oh, sorry. Oh, you've got a microphone already? Great, go for okay. it. Another question for Mr. Depp. You, you talked earlier about the fact that uh, when you were playing up with scissor hands, you were inspired by a dog that you had at the time. Is there an equivalent for this movie, The Lone Ranger, something that inspired you in the same way? Well, uh, I, I, I would say the, mo the most, the thing that inspired me most was, was, um, being able to spend time with, um, with, 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 with some of the, you know, the, the elders of, of uh, the Comanche Nation um, who, who have been very, very kind to not only us, but to, to, to me, um, the Navajo. Uh, spending time with those people, talking about their history, but from their perspective, which is the real perspective, because history is always written by the winners, isn't it? You know, um, um, that in it, in itself was was everything to me. Just being able to, just being welcomed into that world. Yeah. And check shirt in the front row, please. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Army and Johnny. Um, your roles are very athletic. You've got a lot of activity uh, in the film. Did you have to do any special training to uh, get in shape? Or were you already super fit to start with? Super fit, <laughs> always. Um, no, it's funny. Uh, the going, in, going into this movie, there, was, there wasn't any sort of concerted effort on, on my part, at least, to get into any kind of physical shape for vanity purposes, because nobody had gym memberships back then. No one was sitting around doing push-ups. It just it wasn't the thing. You got you got muscular by doing work. So we had cowboy camp, and they they put us to work, taking saddles on and off horses a hundred times, you know, cracking bull whips, throwing lassos, you know, all, all the kinds of stuff you'd do. And apart from that, I, I did a lot of cycling just because I knew there'd be days where we'd spend twelve hours a day in a saddle, and my legs needed to last. So long bike rides, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I, um, I, I, I mean, I felt, I felt it was important to, to, to train for the role of Tonto. First, because, you, you know, you, it's, a, it's a film with Gore and Jerry, and you know <laughs> there's going to be a lot of physical activity, so you want to be prepared for that. And they're, you know, and they, you know it takes us a while to shoot some of these, uh, these sequences, so yeah, you wanted to be ready for all that. Plus, I'm old. And um, 
Yeah, no, you want to, I mean, you want to, you know, before things start to just go completely south, yeah, you want to try and maintain some sort of, <laughs> yeah, physical, you know, you don't want to weep every morning when you wake up. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I, I trained to, to, and also, you know, the, the, the idea, you know, it's, Tonto had to be taken seriously as a warrior, you know, so I couldn't really wander in there like some sort of skinny, junky looking guy. Um, on the left, second row in the American T-shirt. Uh, it's a question for Mr. Verbimsky. Uh, very, very few members of your potential audience will ever have heard of Clayton Moore. Jay Silverheels, or the unlamented Clinton Spilsbury. So, since these characters, or these actors, are at best a very distant memory in cinematic and television senses, why is it then that the Lone Ranger and Tonto remain such iconic images for us? Well, I think it's, uh, there's so many, um, th there's so many kind of, uh, Icons we've taken from you know the William the William you can't think of the William Tell Overture without thinking of the Lone Ranger you can't you know the mask the silver bullet the you know the white horse this um, <coughs> the, the iconography is just in in our culture you know it's, you see the Lone if you've never watched the Lone Ranger you're gonna you know pick up a package of donuts and he's gonna be on the you know the label or something so um, it's kind of yeah, I know the Lone Ranger, but what, I'm not exactly sure what that is. And um, uh, it was a great opportunity for us to to kind of. I think I think there's something about the original TV series that, for me, that was a bit two dimensional in that way. That I could I remembered it, but the, you know he lived by his code, and he was um, uh, you, you know never deviated from that. And I think all, you know the opportunity to come at this from Tonto's perspective and to take the sort of apprentice-master relationship and, and tell an origin story, but say, you know, the, the, the apprentice created the master, if you will. And, and once you start doing that, everything kind of turns upside down. And, um, and you know, creating a, a, a Lone Ranger that, that, uh, that has to deal with his code. He hasn't, his code, you know, he comes with these noble ideas of justice and, 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 and you know, good and, and, and evil and right and wrong, and he comes into a, a version of the West, it's very much like taking Jimmy Stewart and, and throwing him into a Sam Peckinpah movie. You know, he, he's, he's going to have to reconcile um, in, a, in, a, in a time when justice can be purchased, you know, how does, how does that code stand up? And it was important that he's also red-blooded and he, you know, he might lash out, you know, um, you know that his brother's, his brother's death is, is very personal, it's not just, I, I can just, you know, take that and, and put it in a, uh, in a quadrant in my brain and, and sort of continue to function. I think it's, you know, he's, he questions that and, and, and that sort of dimensionalizes them in a way. Um, 